Well, now listen, folks. I'm 73 years old. I'll be 74 in two or three months. Because I was born July the 27th, 1908. And, uh, of course, as I've already told you, there were seven of us boys. And four of us done lots of hunting. One of the others would, would have made a great hunter, and he was just starting at 25 years old. And he was accidentally killed by this fellow when we had this lion tree. But Ernest, Vincent, and Clell and I done lots of hunting. Now the, now the other brother, Bill, he done some. Barney, he never did do any guiding and very much hunting. Because he got married when he was just 19 years old. And he had his nose to the grindstone trying to make a living for his family for many years. And he never got started really in the big game hunting. <clears throat> now we have caught the Lee brothers have been in on the catching of 125 Jaguar. And I have personally been in on I believe 120 of them. And some of my brothers is with me on part of them and, and a lot of them wasn't. Because I really branched out and covered lots more area and done more hunting, I mean guiding, than any of the rest of the boys. Well now I'll tell you, it was a hard go. And I, I put in many hard days and many hard months. And part of the time I was out at night an awful lot. In, but I chose that life and I, I loved it and I lived a good one. And I enjoyed it. And I know that I'm coming to the end of my ropes. I'm still a guiding a little bit with the help of some younger boys that, especially one young boy that I've been a training up that was a mountain raised and raised on a ranch and done some hunting. His name's Jim Brooks, and he's about 23 or 4 years old now. And he's the one that right now that I depend on to help me in my guiding. And he's a good worker and real congenial and a real nice boy. And we have been in on the, the Lee brothers have accounted for a thousand lines or more. And we've accounted for a thousand bar or more. Well, that's a quite a quite a few of those animals. Now you hear of all these crooked guides and how they'll plant animals and all of that for their sportsmen, and there is a lot of them. But there's some honest ones too. Well, now I'll tell you about the planting that the Lee brothers have done. Now I'm. A, Telling all of this by memory that, that reaches back for, for a good many years. We planted four lines. And one of those lines, the fellow, we had him in the cage and sitting under his window when he got to camp. He always asking me if we had him one tied up. So we just tied him one up and set it under his window of the old ranch house that we was going to take him out from. And, of course, he looked at it a lot of times, and we left it there for several days and then turned it out and had a good run and took a bunch of movies and still pictures and all of this line, and he killed it. Now, the other three, the people didn't know that the lines were planted. And out of a thousand bar, we only planted one bar. But a lot of those hunters, guides or so-called and supposed to be good High-powered guides will turn loose almost everything that they that they get, and that's a bad reputation that got down in that country with the line and bear guiding, and that hurt. One particular feller would come up hauling a bunch of dogs and say, well, now this looks like a good fast way for an animal, and turn around and brag to his class 
I know so much more about these other guides where the animals should travel and all that there's no comparison. And one had just crossed over there because he just had it kicked out of a cage probably five minutes before. But there's a lot of guides that are crooked, but let me tell you, there's, there's some good, honest guides right now, and they are, they are honest. Now, that Marvin Glenn that lived down close to Douglas, Arizona, and he hunts my old home range a lot, the cherry cows, and his ranch is in the south end of the cherry cow mountains, and he is honest from the ground up. Then there's Bill Workman. He's up on the Tonto. Now, and he's a, not, a good, honest guide. And then there's Karen LeCount that hunts up there a lot, and she works with Bill Workman quite a lot, and she's a real nice, honest guide. And then there's Jim Brooks. He lives over on a ranch in the Bloody Basin that's north of Phoenix, and he's the one that's been uh, hunting with me, and I've been kind of training him, and he's making a real lion hunter, and he's a pretty good one right now, and he's a good, honest guide. Then there's an old boy up in Utah that I know pretty good, and his name is Charlie Leader, and he's an honest guide, and no planting or anything to it with him. And there's several more out there that I can't call their names off fast enough to put on the tape, but there's still a good bunch of good, honest guides. Well, now, out of the thousand and plus lines and the thousand and plus bears that we've got to our credit, well, and 125 exactly jaguars, and then we've got many bobcats and many ocelot. A lot of them was a tra training dogs, and we never kept track. But we also caught quite a few bobcats and lions for clients that wanted a bobcat and ocelot trophy. And uh, then we've done lots of trapping too. Cause then we never did keep track of the coyotes and all that kind of stuff that we ever trapped, but uh, we've caught lots of them. And all four of us, Ernest, Vincent, and Clell and I, have caught lots of stuff in traps. But we're mostly known for is hound hunters. Well, now there's a they got an animal way down in Mexico that they call the onsa. And there's been a big discussion for quite a few years just what it was. It really looks more like a, a lion than it does, I guess, anything. But we have caught one. And far as I know, that is the only one that's ever been killed by an American. And one of our clients, we were... Jaguar hunting, and one of her clients killed this onsa. And it is a kind of a, well, it's a, more the color of a lion than anything else, but it it is real gray on the forelegs and shoulders and hind legs and, and hips runs up to, to, towards its back. And then it, I mean, almost the color of a deer in gray. And then along its side, it's got kind of the tawny color of a mountain lion. And its head is longer and narrower. And it, the, according to the, and a smaller head than a lion. And the, the ears are much larger to compare with the size of the head than, than the lion, and of course, or, or the jaguar. And, it, and its legs are built between the build of a lion and a cheetah. They're not as, as near as, as slender as a cheetah, but they're not near as muscular and big around as a lion. And then its feet 
it is a no doubt a cat because it has those creases in its heels. But its track is a lot longer built than the track of a lion, and its two toes of in the its two middle toes in its tracks sit out much farther in front of the other two toes than a lion does. And just the, the build of them and the length of them and all, if you don't know what you're looking at, you might call it a wolf track. And it, that's the way it is built. And let me tell you, folks, they are really fleet-footed because I don't know how many that I've run with good, fast hounds and knew what I was after. And that's the only one that our hounds was ever able to tree. Well, <clears throat> I don't consider myself as the greatest hunter in the world or anything, but I do know how to hunt. I do know how to train dogs and I do no sign, and I know the nature of game, and I know where to look for their sign. And uh, I've also hunted, I've hunted in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Nevada, California, and Oregon, and then south I've hunted in Mexico. And in Central America, I've hunted in British Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. And in South America, I've hunted in Venezuela, Colombia, and Bolivia, and was in just the northern part of Argentina. And that's a covering more country, far as I know, than any guide that I've ever heard of in any country. And so I'm not making the, the statement that that I don't say that I know, but far as I know, that's lots of country from from almost up to the Canadian border to the northern part of Argentina, off and on all the way through. Now the the Lee brothers were never known to be wealthy people. And at times, we really had a hard time making a go of it. And we have, the Lee brothers have sold many good hounds. And one reason that we got as good a reputation as we had and have still got is because we were honest in all of our dealings with a man on a dog, and we didn't tell him false statements about a dog. If we were selling a good trained hounds, we always sold them on trial. And we would be unfortunate sometimes because a lot of that meant the man that bought the dogs whether he knew what he was getting and how to hunt and all that. Now, that had a lot to do with it because some of the very best that we've ever sold didn't stand trial and then send them back to us. And we would know exactly what was wrong because that man didn't know a good hound when he got a hold of one. And I'll give you a little uh, instance of that. Here, years ago, we sold two good wine hounds to a fellow and his name was, I happen to remember it, Lamb. And he lived on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. And they were paying bounties on lines up there, they call them cougars. And we shipped him these two dogs and we didn't hear anything from him for about a year. And then we got, got a letter from him saying, well, I got those hounds and I just give, up, give them up as a bad investment. Says, and I just turned them loose out uh, at, at my range and I didn't pay any attention to them. 
when they'd come in, well, they'd go hunting by themselves. And when they come in, I'd just feed them and just let them stay around there and go out and run anything they wanted to run. Never paid any attention to them. And they were paying a bounty then of $100 a line, I believe that's what he said, on that island. Well, he said the other day, just a few days ago, he said, a fella come to me and told me that my hounds had a cougar treed not too far from the ranch over there. And he said, I started dumb and could hear them a barking treed. And I got up pretty fairly close to the tree and another fella beat me there and he killed a cougar and took it. Well, I thought that that wasn't, that he didn't have too much nerve because his dogs had it treed. And if it would, would have been me, that fella and I would have went around and around because I don't think he took that jaguar, I mean cougar. But anyway, then we got another letter from him and it wasn't very long after that. He says, you know, says I've been a hunting those dogs and I've caught several cougars with them now. And he says, you know, those dogs were trailing cougars and I thought they was running deer. And that really made Ernest mad. And he wrote to him and he said, a man that hasn't got any more sense than you got, hasn't got any business with some good hounds. If you don't know anything about hunting, well, how can you expect those dogs to really do their best? He said, now, if there was a real hunter up there and had those dogs, he would catch a lot of stuff. And you know, later on, through the reputation then of those hounds, we sold many a dog then they started it. We sold many a dog to different hunters on Vancouver Island, and we all sold, sold, sold a lot of hounds to the Canadian government that would buy hounds, and then they would hire hunters and distribute them over the island amongst different men, and they would, uh, uh, the government would own the dogs, and these fellows would be just on straight salary. And one time up there, now, I don't know why, but cougars on Vancouver Island were much worse about killing dogs than they were down in our country. And uh, a lot of those fellas only hunted one and two dogs that amounted to anything. So this fellow was a government hunter, and he was also a game warden. They made game wardens out of all the government hunters they had there. And he only had this one dog that we'd ship up to the government from Tucson. And he was trailing a cougar one day and wasn't too far from the dog. Now they done all of their hunting up there, I think mostly afoot. And the dog wasn't too far from him couple of hundred yards and was trailing along and a barking and moving out on the track and he was hurrying trying to keep fairly close to him and he heard a couple of shots and he went up there and there stood a couple of fellows and they'd killed that dog so he went up he showed him the showed him his the, his game warden badge and so he confiscated their guns so he took those guns and he took all the shells out of them and then he turned around and he put both of them son of a guns in the hospital and they was each one of them in the hospital for several days because he really worked them over. So all right, the outcome of it was that they sued him for assault and battery, I guess you'd call it. And right then, the government sued them for the price of the hound, only they paid a whole lot more for the dog than he actually cost. I don't know, they they had to pay several thousand dollars, but suing this old boy for assault and battery and, uh, and in court, well, they didn't collect anything because evidently they were as big and husky looking men as he was. But it, according to the way he put them in the hospital, 
they wasn't nothing like the battler that he was. Well, uh, we sold lots of hounds then. At one time, we sold one or two at a time, and we'd sell them to the Canadian government. And they would not send us the money for those dogs until they had tried them out. So this Jimmy Dewar, that became the most famous lion hunter on Vancouver Island, had bought dogs from us for years and years. The first dog he bought was a, a young dog out of that old blue dog who was a half-brother to Pilot. That old blue dog was his sire. And uh, he bought that blue tick female from us in 19 and 27. She was born in 26 and he bought her just before she was a year old in 27. And he trained her and she made a great hound and that helped of selling dogs. So we sold lots of good hounds up there. And anyway here, while he was one of their head hunters, or he was their head hunter. There was an Indian and his squaw and a little kid on the west coast of that island towards, the, I think, the north end of it. And uh, they were on the beach, and the woman, or right close to the beach, and the woman was a-washing. And I guess the buck was asleep. And the little kid, he was running around there playing. And there was, it was bushes and brush right around there. And now in a minute, why well, this little kid was a screaming and something was a taking him out through this brush. And the old buck just jumped up and run out through there after him. And there was a lion, had that little kid right by the shoulder. And he had on a little bib, pair of bibbed overalls. And just before the the old buck made him drop that little kid, well, it tore his little overalls off. And they just left him laying there. Well, he had really worked that little boy over. He had reached right up with his claw and clawed him right in the eye. And one claw went in behind one eyeball and jerked it right out of his head, just hanging on his cheek. Well, anyway, they, they got him to the doctor after so long a time, but he died that night. And that was along up, up in the middle of the day. And so, all right, then the next day, they flew Jimmy Dewar and another government hunter there in a plane with seven hounds. And the tide was low and they landed on the beach. And they went to where this line had done that, and there was that little boy's overalls laying there. So they put these hounds on the track right there. And they picked it up. And Jimmy Durr was down and visited us later and told us just exactly how everything happened. He said, I didn't explain it to many people up there because he said they wouldn't have knew what I was talking about if I'd have told them. He said, now they cold trailed out there for a ways and after a bit, they throwed up their heads and winded, and away they went. And he said, those dogs must have run 150 yards or farther. And there was a big old cur dog killed and covered up. And he said, uh, uh, got there just as they was really lining out and found that cur dog. And he said, that lion had come back and ate on that cur dog that night and he said probably within a, a half a mile well they had that thing jumped and treated and now he come down and says now I want to know why that lion done that, caught that little boy it wasn't from hunger because it says right there close to that little boy he had two raccoons killed and covered up and I thought about it for quite a while and I said well Jimmy 
I believe that I can tell you the reason that line caught that little boy. I said, that lion evidently didn't know much about people and probably wasn't too much afraid of them. And he was a laying in there right close to those raccoons that he had killed and covered up. And he thought that that little kid was going to bother his kills, so he just caught him. And I said, that would be my, my idea. He said, that lion was probably a, not over a three-year-old lion and was in real good shape and and looked as healthy as a lion could look. And I said, well, that, well, that would be my idea. He said, well, you know, says I'd never thought of that, but he said, I think that's the best explanation that anybody has ever given me. The reason that lion caught that little boy, because he, he certainly didn't catch him on account of hunger. Said he had that cur dog killed and those two raccoons killed. And he had them all covered up. Well, now, they had seven dogs in that pack. And five of those seven were shipped out and sold to the government from Tucson, Arizona, by the Lee brothers. Well, now, as I... I think I told you before, but anyway, well, the Lee brothers were not wealthy people. Of course, we made a good living and we didn't go hungry or anything, but we had to do everything we could to make a good living. And so along with the hunting, we sold lots of good hounds. And we would never sell a good hound if it would hurt her pack. But if we got a, a one that we could uh, sell and not hurt her pack, or maybe throw a younger dog in there that was a, a doing real good that we thought would replace him, we would sell him. And we would sell them on a, on a trial basis. They could uh, try that dog so long. And I'll tell you a stunt that one guy pulled on us because when you try to be honest with them and we always tried to be honest with everybody I'll tell you the stunt he pulled on us this guy bought this hound and he yeah, as I remember he was a kind of a saddleback black and tan we called him Tex and he was a good hound and this fellow bought him and I believe had him around six months. And a neighbor of his then was over to this fellow's house, looking in his hounds and talking to him. And this fellow's hunting partner came over. And so this fellow said, listen, he said, I'm going to write to those Lee boys in a few days, and I'm going to tell them that old Tex was real kind of sick when we got him, and that he never did do any good for us, and that he finally died. And we think that they should ship us another good hound. And that fellow says, well, I thought that that was such a doggone dirty trick of trying to pull that on you boys. So he says, that's how come me to write this letter. And I'm telling you that you'll get a letter, and that's what it's going to tell you. And he's just signed his name, yours in sports. Well, sure enough, in a few days, here this letter come, and it just told just exactly like that fellow said it was going to say. And so, of course, but then we didn't pay no attention to him. He said, Tex, that fellow told us, says, that dog Tex is in fine shape, and he's really doing the work for them, and he's by far the best dog they got. So they thought they'd get another one free of charge. Well, I don't remember, but it was quite a few years ago that they were going to make a trip to the Himalaya Mountains after the abominable snowman. 
So they decided that they would buy a pack of hounds. So they sent and bought three good hounds and high-priced hounds to take on that expedition. So they made it. And they sent us a daily diary of everything that went on after they got through their count. Now listen, this was 14 days a foot one way. Altogether, it was 14 days iron, 14 days back, and you were afoot all the time. And they used what I think they call coolies for pack animals. That was people. And so they it's a cinch for to pack stuff to do that long. There were a lot of people in that expedition. But anyway, well, some of them went high in those Himalaya mountains. They went up way pretty high and made a base camp. And one, <clears throat> after this hour a while, two of these fellows and some natives went much higher into where the snowman was supposed to be running. And they let these dogs run loose, these hounds, after they got out of that base camp, they turned them loose. And they said they'd go out there and run those snow leopards. Well, of course they would, because the snow leopard was a cat, and they was trained on mountain lions and bear. And anyway, when they went up higher, they didn't even take the hounds with them. But they, it was bitter cold, and they put them up a good warm tent, and uh, had the natives, some natives are with them, and they had to put them up a good warm tent, and the tents had zippers on them. But they were, they were cooking outside, then on fire. So one night, well, they heard a bunch of noise out there, and they got up to unzip the tent to go out and see what it was, and it was so cold they had the, the, the zipper froze, and they couldn't get it open, and the next morning, that's what the diary said, well, there was a, where this, had, one of these abdominal snowmen had come up and been all around amongst their pots and pans and rattled them around, and there was his tracks of leaving there in the snow. Well, they didn't never trade him up or anything. So then they'd stay and stay cooped up and stay warm, and they'd send the natives out. Well, one native come in one day and swore, swore up and down that he was right close to one of those abdominal snowmen. But anyway, they didn't get any, so they came back. That was one year. Well they decided that they would make a, an expedition the ne next year. And I'll tell you who was a, a, a sponsor in those hunts and putting up the money. That was Slick of the Slick Airlines that lasted a few years. And then there was a fellow by the name of Johnson from Fort Worth, Texas. And he was a multimillion, a multimillionaire and he made it out of oil. So, all right then. On the next expedition, they got a hold of me and wanted me to go over and take a pack of hounds. And I said, well, that's the way I'm making my living, and for a certain amount and all my expenses, I'll go. And they said, well, how many hounds are you going to take? I said, seven. They said, well, that's a lot of them. I said, well, if that animal's a dangerous animal, we'll need that many. And they said, you realize it's a walking for 14 days. I said, one way. I said, yes, I read that diary before, and I know what kind of what it's like. But I said, listen, I am going to take... a young, good lion hunter here that knows dogs and knows how to help me handle them, and I'm going to take him with me. And Slick said, oh, says, that would be too expensive. 
I said, well, look how much money you're putting out on them expeditions. And I said, you're not producing anything. And I said, if I go over there, I expect to, to, to know all about it and produce if it's possible. And I said, another thing, Mr. Slick, I'm not going to lay in camp, no matter how what the weather is, and send those natives out without I'm with them. And I said, like your men done before. And so he said, well, I'll call you back. And I said, okay. And he's talking to me on the phone. So he called me up three different times. And is trying to get my consent for me to go and not take anybody with me. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, agree to it. And I could tell from his conversation that these other guys that was going on the expedition and more or less run it, running it resented me a-going. So finally, with the last time he called me up, well, he told me, he said, now listen, with the expenses the way they are and all that, we just can't put it up for you to take another man with me. I said, well, Mr. Slick, far as I'm concerned, go right ahead and make the expedition. I said, and flood the dove, just like you done before, after being gone for six months. And I just hung up. And all right then, this Johnson, he was a putting up half of the money, and he knew all about it, and he just got a hold of Slick and said, listen, says, if you don't take that Dale Lee and a pack of hounds and the boy that's gonna, that he was going to take to help him on that expedition, I'm through. I'm not putting up any more money. And he didn't. But old Slick put it all up then, and they made another one. Well, they flubbed the dub, just like I told him they'd do, and, uh, but they never sent us a daily diary on everything that happened like they did on the trip before. So I don't know for sure just what happened on that second trip, but I just know they flubbed the dub and they didn't get any ab abdominal snowman. Well, this happened quite a few years ago and we was lion hunting, I mean bear hunting up on the blue. And Clay on I and we were there at Herschel Downs' ranch, who's been a friend of ours for many years, and we had a party from California. And one of these men was that famous brain surgeon, Rupert Rainey, that hunted with us for many years, and a friend of his, and I've forgotten that friend's name. They were bear hunting. Well, that was a poor fall for bear up there. There wasn't hardly anything for them to eat, and they were really scattered. And we were really having a hard time ever finding a bear track that we could run. And a day or two before this happened, well, we found a fresh track of a two-year-old, and after quite a little jump race, while well, we treated it. And then we had hunted several days and hadn't hit another good bear track. And this bear that we'd caught wasn't just about a two-year-old, so he wasn't a very big bear. So a few days before that, I'd been up above the ranch, which is on K.P. Creek, and K.P. Creek runs out of the White Mountains and hits Blue River, and Herschel Downs' his ranch is on K.P. Creek about a mile before it runs into the Blue. And so after we'd come in one afternoon, well, I was a saddling a horse, sir. And old Herschel said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go up and look at that cow. Because it, she's been dead long enough that she ought to be a smelling pretty loud. And I said, it's bad. Is, a, it, is it is with no mass for these bird eat? I think any bear that finds that cow will eat on her because they're having a hard time finding anything to eat. And he said, well, wait just a minute. He said, let me saddle a horse and go with you. So he did. 
and we had uh, a little shepherd that we had there that we run with the hounds went with us and two of Herschel's cow dogs. And we, we rode up there and it took just an hour and five minutes to get up to where that dead cow was. Right up through the, those rims and box canyons because I rode it many times and I know how long it takes if you just get up and ride right along. So we rode up there and as we're riding up to the cow, I said, Herschel, there's been a bear eating on that cow. And we looked right behind that cow, and there stood this bear looking right at us. Well, we didn't need the one of us have a gun, and we didn't want to kill her anyway. So I said, uh, come on, Herschel, let's rope it. We didn't know then what kind of a bear it was or anything. We just knew it was a bear, but it didn't look like it was very big to me. And boy, we sicked those shepherds, and they was right with us. And when we sicked them, they run out there and seen that bear, and they just built to it. And there's an old female. And she run up under a rim. And I jumped off of my horse, and old Herschel told me, fetch me this rope of his. I didn't even have a good catch rope. And I run up, and then, and those dogs obeying it, and not a minute it, it turned back, and I didn't get a throw at her. And old Herschel was down below me there a ways, and I throwed him that rope, and he reached up and caught it, and caught it with even the loop made just right, and he just twirled that around his head a time or two and let her go, and he just went right around that bear's neck. And I hollered, Dally, Herschel Dally. And down the hill he went, and he dallied around the tree. And, of course, that bear was just throwing a fit. And uh, I said, uh, get your picking string. Get your picking string, and we'll tire. Well, now, let me tell you, he really had two picking strings, but that's not enough to tie a bear with. Well, he run and got his picking strings, and we, we got a hold of that thing, and fooled around there with it, trying to tie it, and with, without enough stuff to tie it with, well, we choked it to death. So, that bar was in an awful hard shape. Her old teeth is wore real bad, and I know that she was a real old female, and she was poor, and her, her hide was no good, it was no trophy. And so we didn't know whether those guys would want her or not. Didn't suppose they would. So we just, instead of trying to take her back to the ranch, we just hung her up there right by the old cow and rode on back to the ranch. And as we rode in the ranch, well, this Rupert Rainey saw us up at the barn, and he walked up there and said, Well, says, did you boys have any luck? And I said, Yeah, we did. But I said, It is all bad. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's a bear eating on that old cow. And I said, and we roped and, tied, and tried to tie it and only had two pigging strings, and that wasn't enough to tie the bear with. But anyway, on the scuffle, we choked it to death. He said, yeah, that sure does sound like a a likely story, I said, well, I can tell you one thing. That's exactly the way it happened. And I said, do you see any guns on her saddles? No. I said, well, do you see any six shooters or anything on her hips? Yeah, no. I said, well, we haven't got a gun. And I said, there's a bear uh, hung up up there by that old dead cow. But I said, now, it's a four trophy. It's an old female with her teeth wore way down, and she's poor as a snake. And I said, to look at her, she looks like she's got on glasses, kind of, because there's not any hair closer than an inch around her eyes. 
all the hairs off. So he said, sure loves to see her. I said, all right, we'll go up by there in the morning and let you take a look at her. And I said, I want you to take a look at her, being as you're kind of doubting it a little bit. Okay, so we did. And they, they looked at her and said, well, that's something roping one. Well, that one, one two-year-old then, he did have a good hide and all, but he wasn't a very good trophy. That's all we, we got on that hunt. And I've told lots of people about old Herschel roping that bear and us trying to tie it. But now let me tell you, a bear would be, if we'd had the stuff with us, it'd have been quite a scuffle to tie that bear. And so that was a, another little hunt that, that was kind of funny. Of course, there wasn't no hounds involved in that hunt. Well, now that Herschel Downs has known him for a long time, and he's a fine fella, and he's a fine friend. But he is always pulling pranks on me, and I'd pull pranks on him. Turnabout was fair play. So I had a big black mule that was a, a, one of the best hunting animals that I was ever straddled. It would, he would probably weigh close to maybe 1,100 pounds, but really I never did weigh him, but he was a good, big, blocky mule. And I thought that he was the fastest mule that I had ever rode. And one day there was the boy that had raised him, come over and saw, saw old Wimpy there and asked me where I got him, and I told him I got him the fellow that he'd sold him to. And he said, well, that's the fastest mule that I ever rode. And this old boy's name was Jimmy Spurgeon. And I said, well, Jimmy, he is me too. That's the fastest mule I ever rode. And old Herschel is standing there and said, well, he might have been a, a few years ago, but he's not now because you found it him so in the mountains that old Rabbit, he had a little fierce black mule there. He said, old Rabbit could outrun him now. And I said, no, Herschel, Rabbit can't outrun him now. And Rabbit never could outrun him. I said, I've rode Rabbit and I've rode Wimpy. And Wimpy's a faster mule than Rabbit. He said, well, I'll just outrun you sometime to show you. I said, all right, you'll have to before I'll believe it. So in a few days, well, we are riding after cattle and made a long round and was coming up the Blue River to take up KP to go to his ranch and oh I imagine it is three o'clock in the afternoon and we met a neighbor girl there horseback and he was a riding old rabbit and I was a riding old wimpy and oh I had been really a riding him and I said say Herschel I said you're riding old rabbit and I said, I looked down, and by golly, I'm riding old Wimpy. I said, let's go up to that cold flat and have a mule race, and I'll show you that old Wimpy can outrun old Rabbit. He said, that's a mile out of the way, and I'm not going to ride the mile out of the way to outrun old Wimpy. I said, well, why are we going to run? He said, we'll run right here on the edge of this river. I said, now, I don't want to do that, Herschel. No, he said, I guess you don't, because you're afraid to run. I said, no, I'm not afraid to run, but I'll just tell you what'll happen. I said, I'll outrun you, and then you'll swear up and down that you didn't get a fire shake. Well, he said, we'll see about that. So here was a fence running right along, and it, didn't, it wasn't right down close to the water, but up a little ways. And there's sparse bushes in there and a few rocks and mostly sand and a few uh, kind of sage bushes. So we rode right along that fence and rode up, I imagine, we run probably 200 yards. And we set this girl right out from a tree and told her, said, now listen, Jackie, her name is Jackie Boaz. 
We said, now listen, Jackie. She was probably 17, 18, 19 years old. We're going to have this mew race, and the first mew between you and that tree wins the race. Now, do you understand that? Because you're the judge. Oh, yes, I understand that. So, all right. So we turned around and we rode back down while we were going to, was going to start the race. So I got down and took my boot heel and drawed a big line across there. Got back up on old Wimpy, and uh, I said, Now, Herschel, I'll give you your choice of how we're going to start. Are we going to walk up to that line, trot up to it, lope up to it, or how we're going to come up to it? Or are we going to stand right up and stand their mule's front feet on that line? Well, I could just more or less see the cogs are working in his head. And he said, uh, I think we ought to ride up and stand with her. Neil's feet right on that line. And I knew the way he figured it. He figured old Rabbit would have a faster getaway than old Wimpy. And I did have old Wimpy rode awful hard. And so I just took down a double of a rope and I spurred him up one side and down the other, and I walked him across the hind end with that rope, and Herschel says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm telling old Wimpy we're going to run a race. I said, he doesn't even know it, and I'm trying to wake him up. So I jobbed him around there a little bit, and so we got ready, and I said, Herschel, what side of the... What side you want on? He said, well, I don't care. I said, well, it does to me. He said, well, what side do you want on? I said, I want on the left-hand side. He said, why? I said, old Wimpy is a left-handed mule, and I want him on the left side. He said, all right, don't make any difference which side I have. So I said, okay. So we got up there, and I still had this big double of rope in my hand, and I said, okay, I said, I'm going to say one, two, and you say three, and I'm going to say go. And when I say go, why, well, it's the first mew between Jack, Jackie and that tree that wins that race. And I said, oh, wait a minute, there's a little technicality to this. I don't run wimpy for nothing. There's always money exchange hands, and when I... Say exchange hands, that means that money goes out of your hand into mine. Now, what are we going to run for? He said, well, how much do you want to bet? I said, well, to make it easy on you, I don't want to win too much money off of you, but I want to win some. I say, how about a 10 spot? Because it'll go from your hand into mine, and that's what I mean, because I, when I run, I run the win. He said, all right, I'll bet you $10. I said, okay. Now let's get ready and get set. So he says, uh, I say one. He's, he says two. And I said three. And I took my double of my rope and I put it over to my left-hand side because old uh, Wimpy was a left-handed mule and I was on the left side. And when he says go, I just throw that loop out in front of old rabbit and spurred old Wimpy, and away I went, and of course that kind of shied her back behind me. And boy, away we went, and I kept a watching kind of behind me, and he went to trying to come around me, and when he would try to come around me, I'd pull over in front of him. And when we went through between Jackie and that tree, where Rabbit's head was right up along with old Wimpy's shoulder, but Wimpy's outrunner by head, uh, neck and the head. And so, all right, then we went on up and turned around and went back, and I said, uh, Jackie, what mule was the first mule between you and that tree? She said, well, old Wimpy was, but says Rabbit passed him right after that. I said, that don't, that don't count. I said, I quit whooping and spurring then. And I said, uh, so 
Wimpy was the first mule. And she said, well, that is right. And I just slapped my hands and slapped my legs and just said, oh, <laughs> oh, that dang it, Herschel, I told you, I told you. Ha, ha, ha. I tucked my hand out and I said, come on, old boy, put that $10 bill right in there. And old Herschel said, can't you wait till you get to the house? Said, besides your crooked. I said, crooked? What do you mean crooked? He said, throwing the rope out in front of old rabbit and all that kind of stuff. I said, Herschel, there were no rules to that mule race. And if we said any rules, I didn't hear them. And I said, I told you that I run a race to win. And by golly, I won and you're going to pay me that ten dollars. He said, well, wait, I don't carry money around in these mountains. Wait till we get out up to the house. I said, all right. And uh, the, the more we'd ride along and I'd slap my shouts and, and just, ah, ha, ha, dang, Herschel. I said, uh, you don't know anything about racing, do you? And oh, the more I'd laugh and slap my shop legs, the madder he'd get. And I guess that we've known one another since 46 or 7 and have been the best of friends from then on. And I guess that's the maddest that he ever was at me. And all of course, I'd just laugh. And the more I'd laugh, the madder he'd get. And finally, we got on up to the we got on up to the house and we put our mules away and all. And when we walked in that house, he is still mad. But I just walked up to him and stuck my hand right in front of him. I said, we're at home now. And when you bet with me, you pay off. Give me that money. And he walked in the room there and come out with a $10 bill and laid it in my hands. And he said, there's your money. Even if you did win it crooked. I said, I didn't win it crooked. I said, I won it. I was the first mule between her and that tree, and that was, as far as I know, all the rules that was set. And uh, so he, he, he cooled off, and a day or two he'd forgot about that, because he's a real nice feller, and by golly, he's still up there and still on this ranch, and always wanting me to come up there and hunt, and I talked to him just a few days, just two or three days ago before I left to come on this trip. And uh, he said, when are you going to come up and catch some of these lines? He said, these guys up here are still not doing the job that they ought to done. And I said, Herschel, I told you when I had to leave up there that you was going to miss old Dale. And he said, uh, I, kn I knew that. And he said, what I mean, we've sure missed you. And if you ever come back on the blue, you got a home at Herschel Downs' home as long as either one of us lives. And uh, so that was uh, the end of the mule story.